So like you, my bracket was blown like the first day. Who is St. Pete's anyway? And, and don't tell me any of you had them in your bracket. I ain't buying that. So I became a Belmont women's basketball fan. And they almost got Tennessee. Almost. But in the course of the production, we were introduced to Belmont Betty. Huh? And now you can get a T-shirt. <laughs> Be like Belmont Betty. Hall of Fame, not, but the T-shirt, that's over the top, huh? Is this what you're going to be buried in? Is this just, thought it was going to be addressed. Now it's the Belmont Betty T-shirt, okay. Betty Wiseman, the one and only, I'll tell you, so. <laughs> Now, right, during that giving moment, you saw me sit. I, I gave online. Promise. <laughs> Promise I did. I know some of you kind of give me the side eye like, you're not moving, brother. No, I'm not. I gave online. <laughs> One of my family's favorite stories, much to the chagrin of my dad, was the time that, see, all my family lived in Mississippi, the Laurel, Mississippi area. That's where all my family was. And Dad had got a promotion through the Army to Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville. So we made a lot of trips between Huntsville and Laurel, Mississippi, and go to Birmingham, go through Tuscaloosa, Meridian, then you get off the interstate. It is a boring trip. Well, my dad is not one for boring. So he found a shortcut. Yeah, you know where this is going, don't you? Okay, so we going a new way. My mother's in the front seat. She says, John, this isn't the way. Oh, I found a new way. We're going, this is a new way. Well, three hours later, we circle back to the same sign that my dad had turned right on to begin with. That trip, we had a special guest, my mother's aunt was in the car, Aunt Vi. When Dad and Mom began to argue that this is the same place we've been, Aunt Vi says, it's been the most beautiful drive. <laughs> I saw my dad grip that, sink, that steering wheel <laughs> like he was just going to rip it right off of the post. You know, the thing about the wrong road, is it takes you to the wrong place. There's nothing about the road itself. It's a good road, fine pavement, well-striped, clear directions. It just goes to somewhere you didn't want to go. The sad thing about the wrong road is you don't find out it's the wrong road until it's too late. When you get to the wrong place, then you realize we've been on the wrong road. When you get to the place you didn't want to go. Now it makes sense. You've been on the wrong road the whole time. Now, we live in a world that says there are lots of ways to God. The saddest thing about that is, is you won't find out it's the wrong road until it's too late. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this very familiar passage in John. And it should be familiar to you because it is the inscription that is over the doors of this sanctuary when you come in. John 14, verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we then know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Your followers had gathered around you moments before your arrest. And in these moments, you were trying to comfort them in this crazy world that we now live in. May you remind us that nothing's changed. You're still the way, still the truth, still the life. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Whenever I'm encouraging people to start Bible study, I always tell them, I want you to start by reading one word of Scripture a day. If you will commit to reading one word of Scripture a day, you will do fine. You'll get started, because I know what will happen. You will want to know what happened in the second word, in the third word. You'll read a whole verse. You'll read a whole chapter. You might even read a whole book, but that'll scare you to death if I tell you that up front. So I just tell you, will you commit to read one word a day? The pushback is always, come on, Mike, you can't do anything in one word. Okay, what is the first word of Scripture? Y'all do know that, don't you? Just in. And it's, it's kind of funny that that's the word that begins all of God's work, the story of all of God's work. It is the word in. Well, the thing is, you can't have in unless you have out. And what you find out when you read the whole book is that God is trying to get in, and we're trying to get out of the mess that we're in. The entire Bible in one word. The next word, the definite article. You do know that that's the word that got Jesus crucified. That word. Not Son of God, not Savior, not Lord, not Messiah, the. You see, nobody in Jesus' day would have gotten upset if he had said, I am a Son of God. Nobody would have gotten upset if he had said he was a way to God. What made everybody mad was when he said the word, the. It still makes them mad. Oh, you can go anywhere and be welcomed anywhere, any institution, any organization, as long as you stand up and you say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, who I believe to be a son of God, who I believe to be a way to, Christ, to, 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 to God. Ah, but when you use the word thee, now you have become, as they say, exclusive. What do you mean there's only one way? God is very big. In fact, God is infinite. There has to be lots of different ways to him. Nothing would tickle me more to find out that there are lots of ways to God. However, he only told us about one. 
That brings us to that second thing, truth, the truth. Now, again, you can say Jesus is a truth all day long. Put the definite article in front of it, and now the world will have trouble with you. The truth. Here's the thing. Sooner or later, truth has to line up with reality. Okay? One and one is two. Now, I love this stuff that they're doing now in math class that says we don't want to hinder our children. I wish they told that to my math teacher. <laughs> she had no problem humiliating you in front of everybody with a red pen that looked like you could see it from the moon when she marked your upon her. You know, that good. Nah, nah. The thing is, there is, there is an exact number. There is a right answer. There is the right answer. Everything else in my math teacher's uh, mind was just opinion, but there was the answer. And you got it by working the mathematical equation. This is my truth, the world will tell you. This is truth as I know it. Well, sooner or later, truth collides with reality. Not the reality that you experience, but the ultimate reality of who Jesus Christ is. Life. Life is the opposite of death. That's what we're told. But there are a lot of us who have beating hearts but have no life. We can't find purpose. We can't find meaning. We can't find hope. And it's all because we're afraid of that word, thee. Look at how Jesus started this passage. You believe in God, believe in me. There's that word again, that belief word that we've come up with a lot in, in, in our teaching of John. Again, most of us in, in, in our conversation, I believe, and we, that's translated hope, wish, think. Mm -mm. For John, is to put your weight down. For John, is to make a hard decision. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he is the way, so I will follow. I will commit to live my life according to his teachings. Do you believe? Commit your life to commit your decisions to the way that Jesus Christ is. You know what I find interesting about this passage? It, it, it's, it's, it's sad that the way that our Bible is broken up and that we come to the beginning of chapter 14 and we think it has nothing to do with chapter 13 or the few verses that are right before it. Okay? Do you see the story right before it? Jesus says, I'm going away. Peter says, I want to come with you. Peter and John, and Jesus says, you can't come with me right now. And Peter, why can't I come with you right now? I'll follow you anywhere. And Jesus shakes his head. He said, Gee, uh, Peter, you won't follow me through the next few days. You will deny me three times. Now, Peter didn't believe Jesus. He thought he would, he would follow Jesus to the death. And you know what happened? He's hanging around. They've arrested Jesus. They're parading Jesus to the street. And Peter is there, but not there, trying to blend into the crowd. And he's confronted by a teenage girl, and he denies that he knows Jesus at all. Did you notice what Jesus says next? In my father's house, 
there are many rooms. That's present tense. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. Yes, I'm going to prepare a place for you. When that is finished, I will come and bring you, and we'll all be together. But right now, right now, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. Right now. I was, I was well into my adulthood. The boys were born. And we were visiting my mom and dad. And we walked into a house that they had moved into. I had never lived in this house. This was not a house of my, of my childhood, okay? Um, my mom loved to redecorate stuff. She loved to, to uh, refurbish stuff. She loved to redo houses. And my dad called me one time. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm at Home Depot running a bunch of errands for your mama. She's about to break me on this house, son. I said, Daddy? Mama's going to have a project. It's either you or the house. <laughs> I'll go get that plywood, son. I thought you would. <laughs> so anytime the house got fixed, Mom would get in and she'd go find another house to redo. Well, if this was another house they'd redone. I'd never lived in this house. So we're bringing our suitcases in. The boys are running through the house. And I said, where do you want to put our stuff, Mom? We'll put it up in your room. Not my room. I'd never lived in this house. Mom, I told her, I don't have a room in this house. And she looked at me and she said, Son, that will always be your room. That will always be your room. Now, I want to stop here just for a minute. I know we are excited about the time we will gather together and the Lord will bring us all home. But for some of you right now, you need to be reminded that you have a room now. It's always your room. And maybe like Peter, you have fallen as flat as you can fall. You have fallen as low as you think you can fall. And maybe you think that the last place you can ever go again is home. But that room belongs to you. The Father says, this will always be your room. And Peter, stumbling away from that interrogation from that teenage girl, must have remembered Jesus said I could come home. I don't know who you are. I don't know your story. But somebody here today needs to be reminded it's always your room. Amen. Yes, there will be a time we long for that. We pray for that. But there's a room in the home that's yours right now. Thomas was a piece of work. Thomas is the all, always the one who is telling Jesus about the reality. A few, er, few chapters earlier, when Jesus decides to go to Jerusalem, Th Thomas reminds him, you know, they're lining up to kill you in Jerusalem. And Jesus goes anyway. <laughs> so Thomas turns to the other disciples and says, well, let's go with him. That way we can at least all die together. 
It's Thomas who won't believe until he sees. It's Thomas who answers back to Jesus. You know the way I'm going. No, we don't. We don't know where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, how in the world are we going to know the way? Don't you love Thomas who asked those questions that you would want to ask if you'd been there? Thomas who looks at Jesus and goes, what? What are you we don't know where you're going. We don't know how to get there. How are we going to follow you? Now, notice how Jesus answers Thomas. It's the same way he answers you and me. I am the way. Now, those little phrases, the I am, would trigger something in the Jewish followers of Jesus. It goes back to the story of Moses. When Moses Ask God for his name. Who will I say sent me? You know, what, you know what Moses is asking for? He's asking for God's cell phone. He is. He wants direct access. When I get up there in front of Pharaoh and it gets where I want to be able to get to you and I don't want to have to go through your, your secretary. I want you on the phone in a hurry. And God tells him, I am. I am who I am, I was who I was, I will be who I will be. In other words, I'm not telling you my name. I will not be summoned by some second-rate shepherd boy. I come when I come, I go when I go. I won't ask your permission either way. And now Jesus uses that same phrase, I am. I am the way. It's not the road. It's the person. Amen. You can't find the way on a map. It's the person of Jesus. He is the way, and he is the only way. Why? Because he is the destination. We are where he is. We follow him who is that way. And as close as possible, we've put our feet right in the steps that he has just left. This is the way. The early, the early uh, followers of Christ were called followers of the way. This is the way that you live your life. This is the way you think. This is the way that you teach. And it's the way because it's based on the truth. The truth because it's the way that gets us to where we want to go. Some of us have bad maps. You're following the map as faithfully as you can, but the map's wrong. The way of Jesus lines up with the truth that lines up with eternal reality. The truth is what learns, uh, lines up with reality. I have to be careful what reality, well, this is my reality. No, you don't get to find reality. Jesus created that reality, and the truth that you are living has to line up with the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do. The way lines up with the truth that brings us the life. Our world defines success in all kinds of ways. Money, fame, possessions. You are successful if you have these things in your life. 
I have had the privilege, and it is, it is a privilege. of being with people in their final moments. I had the privilege of being there with my dad. I had the privilege of being there with saints that I, that you would not know. Not one of them told me about their checkbook. It didn't come up. You know what they talked to me about? Love. Now, either there's one or two stories. Either it was a story of missed love. I should have been a better father. I should have been a better mother. I should have been a better husband or wife. I was such an idiot. This is what matters. Or it was a celebration of love. But that's what they talked about. And they talked about it because that is the currency of heaven. The way, gets us where we're going because it lines up with truth, because it lines up with reality that gives us the life that matters now and will matter then. The way, the truth, and the life. Three descriptions of one person, one relationship. Jesus is the destination. He is the definition that makes life worth it. Now, question. This was told to the disciples. It was told to Simon Peter right after Simon Peter heard he would fail. What wrong roads have you taken? Like I said, what makes the wrong road the wrong road is it takes you to the wrong place. There's nothing wrong with the road. And the fact is some of us are making great time to a place we don't want to be. You get on the road, you feel like you're going right. You feel like you're doing the right thing. But as I would tell the kids at Kairos all the time, I-40 West goes to Memphis. You can feel all you want to. You can think all you want to, but if you stay on I-40, you're going to Memphis. And some of you are on that road, and you're surprised when you get there. when it's where the road goes all the time. You believe the lie. Sooner or later, it won't line up with reality. Which means you miss the life. Now all that was told to Simon Peter right before he messed up what you and I would, would, would call a career ender, right? You can't be a disciple or a follower of Jesus after you do what Simon Peter did. But remember, Jesus told him, in my father's house there's room. You can come home. If you're on the wrong way, road, on the wrong way, that can be reset. If you have believed the lie and you need the truth, that can be found. 
and the life you want more than anything but don't know how to get, that is gift of the same person, and that person is Jesus. If you're not where you want to be, not going where you want to go, Jesus' words to Peter are the same to you. In my Father's house, there's room, and there's one way to get there. After this, after we pray in just a minute, I'll be in the Welcome Center. Go out, turn left, you'll see us. More than anything else, we want to continue this conversation there. We don't want you to go out still missing the way, okay? We've got time, other ministers to be there. More than anything else in the world, we want you to find your way to know that there's room in the Father's house, and that room is yours. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, with every eye closed and every heart bowed before you, we pray now the decisions we make are exactly what you want. The choices we make are exactly what you desire. Friends, please don't leave this place with those questions unanswered. We'll be waiting for you in the Welcome Center.